The Wounded Healer by Henry Nouwen. In our own woundedness, we can become a source of life for others. Chapter 2. Ministry for a Rootless Generation Looking into the fugitive's eyes. Introduction. To set the right tone for a discussion of Christian ministry in tomorrow's world, I'd like to start with a short tale. One day, a young, a young fugitive, trying to hide himself from the enemy, entered a small village. The people were kind to him and offered him a place to stay. But when the soldiers who sought the fugitive asked where he was hiding, everyone became very fe fearful. The soldiers threatened to burn the village and kill every man in it, unless the young man were handed over to them before dawn. The people went to the minister and asked him what to do. The minister, torn between handing over the boy to the enemy or having his people killed, withdrew to his room and read his Bible, hoping to find an answer before dawn. After many hours, in the early morning, his eyes fell on these words, It is better that one man dies than that the whole people be lost. Then the minister closed the Bible, called the soldiers, and told them where the boy was hidden. And after the soldiers led the fugitive away to be killed, there was a feast in the village because the minister had saved the lives of the people. But the minister did not celebrate. Overcome with a deep sadness, he remained in his room. That night an angel came to him and asked, What have you done? He said, I handed over the fugitive to the enemy. Then the angel said, But don't you know that you have handed over the Messiah? How could I know? The minister replied anxiously. Then the angel said, If, instead of reading your Bible, you had visited this young man just once and looked into his eyes, you would have known. While versions of this story are very old, it seems the most modern of tales. Like that minister who might have recognized the Messiah if he had raised his eyes from his Bible to look into the youth's eyes, we are challenged to look into the eyes of the young men and women of today who are running away from our cruel ways. Perhaps that will be enough to prevent us from handing them over to the enemy and enable us to lead them out of their hidden places into the middle of their people where they can redeem us from our fears. It would seem then that we are faced with two questions. First, how do the men and women of tomorrow look today? And second, how can we lead them to where they can redeem their people? One, the men and women of tomorrow. If the men and women of today are often thought of as anonymous members of Reisman's lonely crowd, the men and women of tomorrow will be the children of this lonely crowd. When we look into the eyes of young people, we can catch, we can catch a glimpse of at least a shadow of their world. Christian leadership will be shaped by at least three of the characteristics which the men and women of tomorrow share, inwardness, fatherlessness, and convulsiveness. The minister of tomorrow must indeed take a serious look at those characteristics in his reflections and planning. We might therefore term this generation the inward generation, the generation without fathers, and the convulsive generation. Let us see how these characteristics help us to understand more fully the men and women of tomorrow. Number one, the inward generation. In a recent study of today's college generation, published in October 1969, Jeffrey K. Haddon suggests that the best phrase with which to characterize the coming generation is the inward generation. It is the generation which gives absolute priority to the personal and which tends in a remarkable way to withdraw into the self. This might surprise those who think of our youth as highly activists, sign-carrying protesters who stage teach-ins, sit-ins, walk-ins, and stay-ins all over the country and think of themselves in many terms, but never in terms of inwardness. First impressions, however, are not always the right ones. Let me describe a recent development in a famous youth center in Amsterdam. Recently, this center, called Fantasio, attracted thousands of young people from all over the world to its psychedelic, dreamlike atmosphere. Fantasio was divided into many small, cozy, psychedelically painted rooms. Young people with long beards and long hair and colorful clothing pieced together from old liturgical vestments were sitting there quietly smoking their sticks, smelling their incense, enthralled by the flesh and blood pervading rock rhythms. But now things are different. The young leaders have thrown out all psychedelic stimuli, remodeled their center into a very sober and more or less severe place, and have changed the center's name from Fantasio to Meditation Center The Cosmos. In the first issue of their newspaper, they wrote, cut off your long hair, throw away your beards, put on simple clothes, because now things are going to be serious. Concentration, contemplation, and meditation have become the key words of the place. Yogis give classes in body control. People sit and talk for many hours about Chuang Tzu and the Eastern mystics, and everyone is basically trying to find the road that leads inward. We might be inclined to dismiss this group's behavior as a sort of peripheral oddity found in every modern society, but Jeffrey Haddon shows that this behavior is a symptom of something much more general, much more basic, and much more influential. It is the behavior of people who are convinced that there is nothing out there or up there 
on which they can get a solid grasp, which can pull them out of their uncertainty and confusion. No authority, no institution, no outer concrete reality has the power to relieve them of their anxiety and loneliness and make them free. Therefore, the only way is the inward way. If there is nothing out there or up there, perhaps there is something meaningful, something solid in there. Perhaps something deep in the most personal self holds the key to the mystery of meaning, freedom, and unity. The German sociologist Schelsky speaks about our time as a time of continuing reflection. Instead of an obvious authority telling us how to think and what to do, this continuing reflection has entered into the center of our existence. Dogmas are the hidden realities men have to discover in their inner consciousness as sources of self-understanding. The modern mind, Shelsky says, is in a state of constant self-reflection, trying to penetrate deeper and deeper into the core of its own individuality. But where does this lead us? What kind of men will this inward moving, self-reflecting generation produce? Jeffrey K. Haddon writes, the prospects are both ominous and promising. If turning inward to discover the self is but a step toward becoming a sensitive and honest person, our society's unfettered faith in youth may turn out to be justified. However, inwardness's present mood and form seems unbridled by any social norm or tradition and almost void of notions for exercise of responsibility toward others. Psychology Today, October 1969. Jeffrey K. Haddon is the last one to suggest that the inward generation is on the brink of revitalizing the contemplative life, about to initiate new forms of monasticism. His data show, first of all, that inwardness can lead to a form of privatism, which is not only anti-authoritarian and anti-institutional, but is also very self-centered, highly interested in material comfort and the immediate gratification of existing needs and desires. But inwardness need not lead to such privatism. It is possible that the new reality discovered in the deepest self can be modeled molded into a commitment to transform society. The inwardness of the coming generation can lead either to a higher level of hypocrisy or to the discovery of the reality of the unseen, which can make for a new world. The path it takes will depend to a great extent on the kind of ministry given to this inward generation. Number two, generation without fathers. The many who call themselves father or allow themselves to be called father, from the Holy Father to the many father abbots to the thousands of priest fathers trying to hand over some good news, should know that the last one to be listened to is the father. We are facing a generation which has parents, but no fathers. A generation in which everyone who claims authority because he is older, more mature, more intelligent, or more powerful is suspect from the very beginning. There was a time, and in many ways, we see the last spastic movements of this time still around us, when man's identity, his manhood and power were given him by the father from above. I am good when I am patted on the shoulder by him who stands above me. I am smart when some father gives me a good grade. I am important when I study at a well-known university as the intellectual child of a well-known professor. In short, I am who I am considered to be by one of my many fathers. We could have predicted that the coming generation would, would reject this, since we have already accepted that a man's worth is not dependent on what is given to him by fathers, but by what he makes of himself. We could have expected this since we have said that faith is not the acceptance of centuries-old traditions, but an attitude which grows from within. We could have anticipated this ever since we started saying that man is free to choose his own future, his own work, his own wife. Today, seeing that the whole adult fatherly world stands helpless before the threat of atomic war, eroding poverty and starvation of millions, the men and women of tomorrow see that no father has anything to tell them simply because he has lived longer. An English beat group yells it out. The wall on which the prophets wrote is cracking at the seams. Upon the instrument of death, the sunlight brightly gleams. When every man is torn apart with nightmares and with dreams, Will no one lay the laurel wreath as silence drowns the screams? This is what the coming generation is watching, and they know they can expect nothing from above. Looking into the adult world, they say, I'm on the outside looking inside. What do I see? Much confusion, disillusion all around me. You don't possess me. Don't impress me. Just upset my mind. Can't instruct me or conduct me. Just use up my time. The only thing left is to try it alone not proud or contemptuous of the fathers, telling them what they will do better, but with a deep-seated fear of complete failure. But they prefer failure to believing in those who have already failed right before their eyes. They recognize themselves in the words of a modern song. Confusion will be my epitaph as I crawl a cracked and broken path. If we make it, we can all sit back and laugh. But I fear tomorrow I'll be crying. Yes, I fear tomorrow I'll be crying. But this fearful generation, which rejects its fathers and quite often rejects the, le the legitimacy of every person or institution that claims authority, is facing a new danger, becoming captive to itself. 
David Reisman says, as adult authority disintegrates, the young are more and more the captives of each other. When adult control disappears, the, the young's control of each other intensifies. Psychology Today, October 1969. Instead of the father, the peer becomes the standard. Many young people who are completely unimpressed by the demands, expectations, and complaints of the big bosses of the adult world show a scrupulous sensitivity to what their peers feel, think, and say about them. Being considered an outcast or a dropout by adults does not worry them, but being excommunicated by the small circle of friends to which they want to belong can be an unbearable experience. Many young people may even become enslaved by the tyranny of their peers. While appearing indifferent, casual, and even dirty to their elders, their indifference is often carefully calculated, their casualness studied in the mirror, and their dirty appearance based on a detailed imitation of their friends. But the tyranny of fathers is not the same as the tyranny of one's peers. Not following fathers is quite different from not living up to the expectations of one's peers. The first means disobedience, the second, nonconformity. The first creates guilt feelings, the second, feelings of shame. In this respect, there is an obvious shift from a guilt culture to a shame culture. This shift has very deep consequences. For if young, if youth no longer aspires to become adult and take the place of fathers, and if the main motivation is conformity to the peer group, we might witness the death of a future-oriented culture or, to use a theological term, the end of an eschatology. Then we no longer witness any desire to leave the safe place and to travel to the father's house, which has so many rooms, any hope to reach the promised land, or to see him who is waiting for his prodigal son, any ambition to sit at the right or the left side of the heavenly throne. Then staying home, keeping in line, and being in with your little group becomes important. But that also is an absolute vote for the status quo. This aspect of the coming generation raises serious questions for Christian leadership of tomorrow. But we would be getting a very one-sided picture as a basis for this leadership if we did not first take a careful look at the third aspect of the coming generation, called convulsiveness. Number three, the convulsive generation. The inwardness and fatherlessness of the coming generation might lead us to expect a very quiet and contented future in which people keep to themselves and try to conform to their own little in-groups. But then we must take into account the fact that these attributes are closely related to a very deep-seated unhappiness with the society in which the young find themselves. Many young people are convinced that there is something terribly wrong with the world in which they live, and that cooperation with existing models of living would constitute betrayal of themselves. Everywhere we see restless and nervous people, unable to concentrate and often suffering from a growing sense of depression. They know that what is shouldn't, they know that what is shouldn't be the way it is, but they see no workable alternative. Thus, they are saddled with frustration, which often expresses itself in undirected violence, which destroys without clear purpose, or in suicidal withdrawal from the world, both of which are signs more of protest than of the results of a newfound ideal. Immediately after the surrender of the exhausted state of Biafra, two high school boys in France, Robert, 19 years old, and Regis, 16 years old, burn themselves to death and urge many of their peers to do the same. Interviews with their parents, pastors, teachers, and friends revealed the horrifying fact that both of these sensitive students had become so overwhelmed by the hopeless misery of mankind and by the incapacity of adults to offer any real faith in a better world that they chose to set their bodies afire as their ultimate way of protest. To reach a better understanding of the underlying feelings of such students, let me quote from the letter of a student who had stopped studying and was still trying to find a new world. He wrote to his mother on January 1st, 1970, Society forces me to live an unfree life, to accept values which are not values to me. I reject the society as it now exists as a whole, but since I feel compassion for people living together, I try to look for alternatives. I've given myself the obligation to become aware of what it means to be a man and to search for the source of life. Church people call it God. You see that I am traveling a difficult road to come to self-fulfillment, but I am proud that I seldom did what others expected me to do in line with a so-called normal development. I really hope not to end up on the level of a square, chained to customs, traditions, and the talk of next door neighbors. This letter seems to me a very sensitive expression of what many young people feel. They share a fundamental unhappiness with their world and a strong desire to work for change, but they doubt deeply that they will do better than their parents did and almost completely lack any kind of vision or perspective. Within this framework, I think that much erratic and undirected behavior is understandable. A man who feels caught like an animal in a trap may be dangerous and destructive because of his undirected movements caused by his own panic. 
This convulsive behavior is often misunderstood by those who have power and feel that society should be protected against protesting youth. They do not recognize the tremendous ambivalence behind much of this convulsive behavior. And rather than offering creative opportunities, they tend to polarize the situation and alienate, alienate even more those who are in fact only trying to find out what is worthwhile and what is not. Similarly, sympathetic adults may misread the motives of the young. Reisman, in an article about radical students on campus, writes that many adults fear to be thought old-fashioned or square and, by taking the part of the radical young without seeing the latter's own ambivalence, they are often no help to them, but contribute to the severity of pressures from the peer group. And I expect to see that some faculty who have thought of themselves as very much on the side of students will themselves join the backlash when many students fail to reciprocate, reciprocate and are essentially hostile towards the permissive faculty who have in the past been on their side. Psychology Today, October 1969. The generation to come is seeking desperately for a vision, an ideal to dedicate themselves to, a faith if you want. But their drastic language is often misunderstood and considered more a threat or a sturdy, or a sturdy conviction than a plea for alternative ways of living. Inwardness, fatherlessness, and convulsiveness. These three characteristics of today's young people draw the first lines on the face of the coming generation. Now we are ready to ask what is expected of him who aspires to be a Christian leader in the world of tomorrow. Two, tomorrow's leader. When we look for the implications of our prognosis for the Christian ministry of the future, it appears as though three roles ask for special attention. One, the leader as the articulator of inner events. Two, the leader as a man of compassion. Three, the leader as contemplative critic. Number one, the minister as the articulator of inner events. The inward man is faced with a new and often dramatic task. He must come to terms with the inner tremendum. Since the God out there or up there is more or less dissolved in the many secular structures, the God within asks our ass attention as never before. And just as the God outside could be experienced not only as a loving father, but also as a horrible demon, the God within can be not only the source of a new creative life, but also the cause of a chaotic confusion. The greatest complaint of the Spanish mystics, St. Teresa of Avila and St. John of the Cross was that they lacked a spiritual guide to lead them along the right paths and enable them to distinguish between creative and destructive spirits. We hardly need to emphasize how dangerous the experimentation with the interior life can be. Drugs, as well as different concentration practices and withdrawal into the self often do more harm than good. On the other hand, it is also it also is becoming obvious that those who avoid the painful encounter with the unseen are doomed to live a super, supercilious, boring, and superficial life. The first and most basic task required of the minister of tomorrow, therefore, is to clarify the immense confusion which can arise when people enter this new in internal world. It is a painful fact, indeed, to realize how poorly prepared most Christian leaders prove to be when they are invited to be spiritual leaders in the true sense. Most of them are used to thinking in terms of large-scale organization, getting people together in churches, schools, and hospitals, and running the show as a circus director. They become unfamiliar with, and even somewhat afraid of, the deep and significant movements of the Spirit. I'm afraid that in a few decades, the church will be accused of having failed in its most basic task, to offer men creative ways to communicate with the source of human life. But how can we avoid this danger? I think by no other way than to enter ourselves, first of all, into the center of our existence and become familiar with the complexities of our inner lives. As soon as we feel at home in our own house, discover the dark corners as well as the light spots, the closed doors as well as the drafty rooms, our confusion will evaporate, our anxiety will diminish, and we will become capable of creative work. The key word here is articulation. The man who can articulate the movements of his inner life, who can give names to his varied experiences, need no longer be a victim of himself, but is able slowly and consistently to remove the obstacles that prevent the spirit from entering. He is able to create space for him whose heart is greater than his, whose eyes see more than his, and whose hands can heal more than his. This articulation, I believe, is the basis for a spiritual leadership of the future, because only he who is able to articulate his own experience can offer himself to others as a source of clarification. The Christian leader is, therefore, first of all, a man who is willing to put his own articulated faith at the disposal of those who ask his help. In this sense, he is a servant of servants, because he is the first to enter the promised but dangerous land, the first to tell those who are afraid what he has seen, heard, and touched. This might sound highly theoretical, 
but the concrete consequences are obvious. In practically all priestly functions, such as pastoral conversation, preaching, teaching, and liturgy, the minister tries to help people to recognize the work of God in themselves. The Christian leader, minister, or priest is not one who reveals God to his people, who gives something he has to those who have nothing, but one who helps those who are searching to discover reality as the source of their existence. In this sense, we can say that the Christian leader leads man to confession in the classic sense of the word, to the basic affirmation that man is man and God is God, and that without God, man cannot be called man. In this context, pastoral conversation is not merely a skillful use of conversational techniques to manipulate people into the kingdom of God, but a deep human encounter in which a man is willing to put his own faith and doubt, his own hope and despair, his own light and darkness at the disposal of others who want to find a way through their confusion and touch the solid core of life. In this context, preaching means more than handing over a tradition. It is rather the careful and sensitive articulation of what is happening in the community so that those who listen can say, You say what I suspected. You express what I vaguely felt. You bring to the fore what I fearfully kept in the back of my mind. Yes, yes, you say who we are. You recognize our condition. When a listening man is able to say this, then the ground is broken for others to receive the word of God. And no minister need doubt that the word will be received. The young especially do not have to run away from their fears and hopes, but can see themselves in the face of the man who leads them. He will make them understand the words of salvation, which in the past often sounded to them like words from a strange and unfamiliar world. Teaching in this context does not mean telling the old story over and over again, but the offering of channels through which people can discover themselves, clarify their own experiences, and find the niches in the word of God in which the word of God can take firm hold. And finally, in this context, liturgy is much more than ritual. It can become a true celebration when the liturgical leader is able to name the space where joy and sorrow touch each other as a place in which it is possible to celebrate both life and death. So the first and most basic task of the Christian leader in the future will be to lead his people out of the land of confusion into the land of hope. Therefore, he must first have the courage to be an explorer of the new territory in himself and to articulate his discoveries as a service to the inward generation. Number two, compassion. By seeking about, by speaking about articulation as a form of leadership, we have already suggested the place where the future leader will stand, not up there, far away or secretly hidden, but in the midst of his people with the utmost visibility. If we now realize that the future generation is not only an inward generation asking for articulation, but also a fatherless generation looking for a new kind of authority, we must consider what the nature of this authority will be. To name it, I cannot find a better word than compassion. Compassion must become the core and even the nature of authority. When the Christian leader is a man of God for the future generation, he can be so only in so far as he is able to make the compassion of God with man, which is visible in Jesus Christ, credible in his own world. The compassionate man stands in the midst of his people, but does not get caught in the conformist forces of the peer group, because through his compassion, he is able to avoid the distance of pity, as well as the exclusiveness of sympathy. Compassion is born when we discover in the center of our own existence, not only that God is God and man is man, but also that our neighbor is really our fellow man. Through compassion, it is possible to recognize that the craving for love that men feel resides also in our own hearts, that the cruelty that the world knows all too well is also rooted in our own impulses. Through compassion, we also sense our hope for forgiveness in our friends' eyes and our hatred in the bitter in their bitter mouths. When they kill, we know that we could have done it. When they give life, we know that we can do the same. For a compassionate man, nothing human is alien. No joy and no sorrow. No way of living and no way of dying. This compassion is authority because it does not tolerate the pressures of the in-group, but breaks through the boundaries between languages and countries, rich and poor, educated and illiterate. This compassion pulls people away from the fearful click, click, click into the large world where they can see that every human face is the face of a neighbor. Thus, the authority of compassion is the possibility of man to forgive his brother, because forgiveness is only real for him who has discovered the weakness of his friends and the sins of his enemy in his own heart, and is willing to call every human being his brother. A fatherless generation looks for brothers who are able to take away their fear and anxiety, who can open the doors of their narrow-mindedness and show them that forgiveness is a possibility which dawns on the horizon of humanity. The compassionate man who points to the possibility of forgiveness helps others to free themselves from the chains of their restrictive shame, allows them to experience their own guilt, and restores their hope for a future in which the lamb and the lion can sleep together. 
But here we must be aware of the great temptation that will face the Christian minister of the future. Everywhere Christian leaders, men and women alike, have become increasingly aware of the need for more specific training and formation. This need is realistic and the desire for more professionalism in the ministry is understandable. But the danger is that instead of becoming free to let the spirit grow, the future minister may entangle himself in the complications of his own assumed competence and use his specialism as an excuse to avoid the much more difficult task of being compassionate. The task of the Christian leader is to bring out the best in man and to lead him forward to a more human community. The danger is that his skillful diagnostic eye will become more an eye for distant and detailed analysis than the eye of a compassionate partner. And if priests and ministers of tomorrow think that more skill training is the solution for the problem of Christian leadership for the future generation, they may end up being more frustrated and more and disappointed than the leaders of today. More training and structure are just as necessary as more bread for the hungry. But just as bread given without love can bring war instead of peace, professionalism without compassion will turn forgiveness into a gimmick and the kingdom to come into a blindfold. Into a blindfold. This brings us to the final characteristic of the Christian leader of the future generation. If he is to be not just one in the long row of professionals who try to help man with their specific skills, if he is really to be an agent leading from confusion to hope and from chaos to harmony, he must be not only articulate and compassionate, but a contemplative at heart as well. Number three, the minister as, com as contemplative man. We've said that the inward fatherless generation desperately wants to change the world in which they live, but tends to act spastically and convulsively in the face of a lack of a credible alternative. How can the Christian leader direct their explosive energy into creative channels and really be an agent of change? It might sound surprising and perhaps even contradictory, but I think that what is asked of the Christian leader of the future is that he be a contemplative critic. I hope I will be able to prevent the free association of the word contemplative with a life lived behind walls with a minimal contact with what is going on in the fast moving world. What I have in mind is a very active, engaged form of contemplation of an evocative nature. This needs some some explanation. The man who does not know where he is going or what kind of world he is heading toward, who wonders if bringing forth children into this chaotic world is not an act of cruelty rather than love, will often be tempted to become sarcastic or even cynical. He laughs at his busy friends, but offers nothing in place of their activity. He protests against many things, but does not know what to witness for. But the Christian minister who has discovered in himself the voice of the Spirit and has rediscovered his fellow men with compassion might be able to look at the people he meets, the contacts he makes, and the events he becomes a part of in a different way. He might reveal the first lines of the new world behind the veil of everyday life. As a contemplative critic, he keeps a certain distance to prevent his becoming absorbed in what is most urgent and most immediate, but that same distance allows him to bring to the fore the real beauty of man and his world, which is always different, always fascinating, always new. It is not the task of the Christian leader to go around nervously trying to redeem people, to save them at the last minute, to put them on the right track, for we are redeemed once and for all. The Christian leader is called to help others affirm this great news and to make visible in daily events the fact that behind the dirty curtain of our painful symptoms, there is something great to be seen, the face of him in whose image we are shaped. In this way, the contemplative can be a leader for a convulsive generation because he can break through the vicious cycle, circle of immediate needs asking for immediate satisfaction. He can direct the eyes of those who want to look beyond their impulses and steer their erratic energy into creative channels. Here we see that the future Christian minister can in no way be considered one concerned only about helping individuals to adapt themselves to a demanding world. In fact, the Christian leader who is able to be a critical contemplative will be a revolutionary in the most real sense, because by testing all he sees, hears, and touches for its evan evangelical authenticity, he is able to change the course of history and lead his people away from their panic-stricken convulsions to the creative action that will make a better world. He does not shoulder every protest sign in order to be in with those who express their frustration more than their ideas, nor does he easily join those asking for more protection, more police, more discipline, and more order. But he will look critically at what is going on and make his decision based on insight into his own vocation, not on the desire for popularity or the fear of rejection. He will criticize the protesters as well as the rest seekers when their motives are false and their objections dubious. The contemplative is not needy or greedy for human contacts, 
but is guided by a vision of what he has seen beyond the trivial concerns of a possessive world. He does not bounce up and down with the fashions of the moment because he is, he is in contact with what is basic, central, and ultimate. He does not allow anybody to worship idols, and he constantly invites his fellow man to ask real, often painful, and upsetting questions, to look behind the surface of smooth behavior, and to take away all the obstacles that prevent him from getting to the heart of the matter. The contemplative critic takes away the illusory, the illusory mask of the manipulative world and has the courage to show what the true situation is. He knows that he is considered by many as a fool, a madman, a danger to society, and a threat to mankind, but he is not afraid to die since his vision makes him transcend the difference between life and death and makes him free to do what has to be done here and now, notwithstanding the risks involved. More than anything else, he will look for signs of hope and promise in the situation in which he finds himself. The contemplative critic has the sensibility to notice the small mustard seed and the trust to believe that when it is grown, it is the biggest shrub of all and becomes a tree so that the birds of the air come and shelter in its branches. Matthew 13, 31 to 32. He knows, that, he knows that if there is hope for a better world in the future, the signs must be visible in the present, and he will never curse the now in favor of the later. He is not a naive optimist who expects his frustrated desires to be satisfied in the future, nor a bitter pessimist who keeps repeating that the past has taught him that there is nothing new under the sun. He is rather a man of hope who lives with the unshakable conviction that now he is seeing a dim reflection in a mirror, but that one day he will see the future face to face. The Christian leader who is able not only to articulate the movements of the spirit, but also to, con to contemplate his world with a critical but compassionate eye may expect that the convulsive generation will not choose death as the ultimate desperate form for protests, but instead the new life of which he has made visible the first hopeful signs. Conclusion. We looked into the eyes of the young fugitive and found him inward, fatherless, and convulsive. We wanted to prevent ourselves from handing him over to the enemy to be killed. We wanted instead to lead him to the center of our village and to recognize in this coming man the redeemer of a fearful world. To do this, we are challenged to be articulate, articulate, compassionate, and contemplative. Is this too much of a task? Only if we feel we have to accomplish this individually and separately. But if anything, has become clear in our day. It is that leadership is a shared vocation which develops by working closely together in a community where men and women can make each other realize that, as Telhard de Chardin remarked, to him who can see, nothing is profane. Having said all this, I realize that I have done nothing more than rephrase the fact that the Christian leader must be in the future what he has always had to be in the past, a man of prayer, a man who has to pray, and who has to pray always. That I bring up the simple fact at this point may be surprising, but I hope I have succeeded in taking away all the sweet, pietistic, and churchy aura attached to this often misused word. For a man of prayer is, in the final analysis, the man who is able to recognize in others the face of the Messiah and make visible what was hidden, make touchable what was unreachable. The man of prayer is a leader precisely because through his articulation of God's work within himself, he can lead others out of confusion to clarification. Through his compassion, he can guide them out of the closed circuits of their in-groups to the wide word world of humanity. And through his critical contemplation, he can convert their convulsive destructiveness into creative work for the new world to come.